Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Daily Devotions through Redeeming Life Fellowship. I'm uh, Dan. I'm the teaching pastor here at uh, Redeeming Life. And it's just great to have you today. And uh, today we're going to be continuing our daily devotions through the Psalms and focusing on Psalms uh, 128 and 129. For those of you who don't know, uh, our reading plan follows the Revive School reading plan, which takes you throughout the Old and New Testaments over two years and uh, has daily reading portions to follow along so that we can uh, read through uh, and study and grow uh, through these books one at a time. And so uh, if you haven't found that, there should be links uh, in the description below uh, to that. You should also be able to find connections with our Facebook page, our website, uh, have uh, places uh, uh, online for giving to help support uh, this church plant to Whitley County, Indiana. So, but without further ado, let's jump into Psalms 128 and 129. Tom, Bryce, uh, Faith, Glenn, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, pause, and take time to read uh, over Psalms uh, 128, and then we'll pause, uh, we'll discuss it, and then jump into Psalm 129. So, go for it. So, yeah, Psalm 128. Now, there's an important thing to note about a psalm like Psalm 128. Uh, like many of the psalms, including uh, Psalm 1, for example, Psalm 128 is what you might call a wisdom psalm, which uh, is wants to, to speak to the, the way of the righteous against the way of the wicked. And uh, it's, it's designed, as it were, not to establish a guaranteed promise, but to rather outline a general principle. And in this case, the general principle and focus is about the blessedness of those who fear the Lord and the way in which that, that the fear of the Lord translates to blessing and blessing measured by way of prosperity. Now, maybe you, like me, maybe it's just me, I don't know, uh, have you gone to places, proud, mostly like Hobby Lobby or even, you know, Michael's, those home decor stores, and uh, even Cracker Barrel to some extent, and Dollar General, it's, it's not uncommon to find uh, uh, home decorations that say something to the extent of, bless this home, bless this house, uh, bless this house with love and laughter. And uh, those are nice decorations. And uh, they are, but I, but I find them interesting because to me, I don't know if I always know clearly what it is that those mean. Or rather, that we'll use the language of bless you, uh, bless you and your family, uh, God bless you, bless our home, without ever really having any clear idea about uh, about what we mean by the word bless. I think a psalm like Psalm 128 uh, helps us get some clearer idea as to what that means, so that when I'm in the laundry room and am seeing uh, a, 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 a decoration that was in this house when, our, when we first moved in here that says, bless this home with love and laughter, I can look at that and say, okay, I, I know the bigger picture of not only what that means, but why that statement, bless this home with love and laughter, is actually meaningful. Uh, because isn't it true that we all desire prosperity? I, I don't know uh, anyone who who looks at a life of of poverty and destitution and affliction 
living a life where there's there's no fruit to be had, but all that's left is despair. Whoever look at, at that kind of a life and say, that's the life I want to live. I don't really think anybody believes that, or if they do believe that, that, that they look at a life of prosperity or a life of destitution as uh, the beginning stages of something better. But the truth of the matter is that we do all desire prosperity, or to put it another way, we desire that all of our work and all of our energy and our toil, our sweat, our blood, that all of it is spent not just simply within a worthy cause, but a fruitful cause. That, that by the time that you've poured yourself out into, into your work, into raising children, into going to work and coming back, that there's going to be something to show for it. What I see in Psalm 128 uh, prompts me to ask the question, not just simply how is it that I achieve that kind of prosperity, but also how I measure it. Uh, because I can uh, work hard, get a great education, uh, have a wonderful job that uh, gets me uh, an income into the, you know, six or seven figures. And all of those things can get me uh, great power and great wealth uh, that can be measured in nice houses, great cars, uh, luxurious vacations, uh, the best medicine that's available. All those sorts of things can be at my fingertips. Uh, but whether or not that, that that type of prosperity is the sort of prosperity that's in view here, uh, I think that, that even if I have a life that's measured by material wealth, that does not mean that I'm living a life that's blessed by God. Uh, because what I see also in Psalm 128 is a measure of prosperity that isn't just simply about material wealth, but the wealth that's measured by the growth and the multiplication and the wholeness and the fruitfulness that comes from a family, uh, which is indeed, mark you, mark, mind this, uh, a, uh, a key feature or, or a key aspect of the blessedness of God that's measured uh, from the very beginning in Genesis, where God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Or when God has establishes his covenant with Abraham, and he says, you and your seed, I'm going to bless that you're going to be fruitful and multiply. And through you, all of the nations are going to be blessed. This blessedness, if we could summarize it, uh, is the lasting fruit that comes out of walking in right relationship with God. As in Psalm 128, the way in which uh, the majority of the psalm is sandwiched between, what does it say? Blessed are those who fear the Lord. The, uh, uh, onward, and, uh, and then it says, thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. And what I'm encouraged to, to see here in a psalm like Psalm 128, is that what God intends to do by way of blessing is a fruitfulness that's not simply measured in material wealth, but fruitfulness that's measured with regards to uh, not just simply um, the family, and the propagation a fruitful uh, spouse and um, children who are fruitful. But if you could summarize it in, in one word, I think, is that of legacy. I, I shall never forget one of the things that my brother, who's an English professor, an academic, uh, one of the things that he learned when when one of his professors passed this down to him. And my brother at that time was working on his doctorate. And so, um, you know, he's up to his neck, even past it probably 
in research and teaching classes and grading. And uh, he's in this stage where he's talking about thinking about when I have to focus my work um, or when, when all these things are clamoring for my attention, where is it that I'm devoting most of my attention? And one of his professors passed on this nugget of wisdom to him. And he said, Steve, when you're a professor, and uh, remember, it is great to be able to publish papers, write and present, and build uh, your, your resume with all these kinds of impressive things that are going to uh, excel you to, to get you to climb the ladder of success. But he said, but remember, your legacy is your students. Your legacy, what you're going to be remembered by, are the sort of things that you taught to your students and the students taught to their students. And they didn't just teach it, but they lived it. The legacy uh, doesn't come by way of material advancement, but the sort of thing that you pass down to uh the people who are entrusted to your care. And certainly what I see uh, in this sort of thing is that that the growth and the prosperity that, that we're encouraged to measure is not just simply material wealth, not just simply the growth and propagation of, of the family unit and families who create more families, who create cultures, who create societies, who create civilizations. At the heart of this sort of thing, that the key to, to that material blessing is rooted in the fear of the Lord. And that's a key that you're, we're certainly going to be uh, taking with us and mulling over in this general principle of, of godly wisdom that, that lasting blessedness cannot be had apart from the fear of the Lord. And so I would encourage you, if you have the those kinds of decorations in your house, as I have, Julie can tell you, I probably wanted to remove them because I thought that they were tacky. But the, the message of those, if you understand them well, are very powerful. So that when I see a sign that says, bless this home with love and laughter, my mind can go straight back to a psalm like Psalm 128, that if that's the fruit of what I want of all of my toil and my labor, I've got to have the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that the, has to be the guiding principle in the way in which I orient all of my life and the way I uh, not just seek prosperity, but the way I measure prosperity. Uh, because uh, wealth can buy you a lot of things. Wealth cannot buy you a legacy. But the fear of the Lord can give you a lasting legacy. That's Psalm 128. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's pause. Uh, Faith, B, whoever's listening, uh, pause and uh, go ahead and read Psalm 129. And we'll go from there. So Psalm 129 is kind of interesting, isn't it? And not least because it has certain features, uh, certain, I guess you would say, like tones that are wrought with uh, affliction and even uh, a righteous anger that when we pick it up to read it, uh, it's either on the one hand very foreign, like grass growing on the roofs, uh, or even just simply uncomfortable. Uh, so it, Psalm 129 can be something that that is is just very hard for us to grasp what's being said and what's being meant and how it's ap how it's applicable for us today. And if I could summarize what it is that's being said, there's a key to it at the very beginning that helps us capture what's mean what's what's meant by the whole psalm and how it's meant for us today. So looking at Psalms 
uh, the, excuse me, Psalm 129 verses 1 through 2. They have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Let Israel say, another word for like the congregation, let Israel say. So there's this refrain uh, so that when the person who's leading the psalm in this congregational psalm, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. So let Israel say, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth, but they have not gained the victory over me. So let's pause on that for just a second. Uh, when What's being meant by they have oppressed me from my youth? And let Israel say. If a congregation is gathering together as a community to say, uh, they have oppressed me from my youth, they are not, I don't think, meant to, in this moment, to be thinking in terms of oppressions from youth that they themselves have experienced in the same way that you and I might uh, reflect on certain oppressions that we experienced from the youth. Maybe for you it was a, a bully at school who, uh, you know, uh, punched you out of your lunch money, or uh, 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 a love affair, that, you know, between a bad, you know, breakup with a bad boyfriend or bad girlfriend and that kind of oppression and affliction and anxiety that, you know, most of us have experienced from our youth or even, goodness me, um, afflictions that come from within a domestic con conflict of oppressions from youth, whether it's from a father or a mother, or in my case, being homeschooled with three older brothers, getting my face ground into the living room carpet by my older brother, which I forgive him for. Uh, I don't hold that against, against him that, for that, but I, I haven't forgotten, but I forgive. Uh, they have oppressed me from my youth. That what's happening in that case is that the congregation is reflecting on their history as a nation and their history as God's chosen people and the afflictions and oppression that they themselves and their ancestors and their fathers and their fathers before them and their fathers, 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 fathers have experienced from the very beginning. And, uh, you could see, certainly looking at the history of Israel from uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the patriarchs and their slavery in Egypt, it's one that's marked with affliction and uh, oppression at pretty much every corner. They are invited to reflect on, on those afflictions, and not just simply to reflect on those afflictions, that they have been afflicted and oppressed and despised and punished and uh, taken advantage of, and yet nevertheless, they are still standing. They are still there. The sum of all of those afflictions that have come, that have mounted up and lasted and been remembered over the years and the years, have not amounted to annihilation, where not only are the people themselves uh, destroyed, uh, as it would be in a true genocide, but even the memory of them is gone. That despite all of those sorts of things, and perhaps even because of them, that they're still standing. And what's happening in those cases is, is that, that as they're reflecting on, on those occasions of again and again and again and again being pounded into the dust, that nevertheless that they're still standing and that these oppressors have not gained the victory over Israel. Plowmen have plowed their backs and made their furrows long, but the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. If it hasn't happened yet, the time of your testing of your faith and the testing of my faith is going to come. And it's going to come by way of, of suffering uh, and affliction, and in some cases, oppression, unjust oppression. The question when you're experiencing, when you're in the throes of that kind of despair and discouragement and depression, you're going to wonder whether or not 
you're going to survive and whether or not your faith is going to last or whether or not you're going to just give up on God um, and his covenant love and his faithfulness. It's in those times that we're encouraged to read a psalm like Psalm 129 and not just simply reflect on Israel's past and the way in which God sustained his people through affliction, but actually brought about his purposes through that affliction. Because it's in that moment when everything seems to be going downhill that you wonder, like, God, where are you in this? Where are you in the midst of this suffering? Uh, and to remember that the people of God historically have wrestled uh, with those same questions. <laughs> and as they wrestled with them and their faith was tested and strengthened through that, the, the, that, that kind of oppression, that we too are going to experience that. It's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Uh, but whether or not our faith is going to last through that kind of affliction and that kind of oppression, that's the question. And uh, a reading through Psalm 129 is designed to strengthen that, that kind of faith. But I digress. I, I want to uh, focus on two somewhat foreign, or they're certainly foreign to us, foreign ideas, foreign uh, uh, figures of speech. Uh, focus on, uh, may all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. If you've been following through us through the Psalms, you know that the word for Zion, the name Zion, the designation Zion, comes over again and again and again. And if I haven't unpacked it at least a little bit, I apologize. But when you think about uh, Zion, it's another word that's oftentimes used like in reference to Mount Zion um, and used in as, as another word for mention of a city of the dwelling of God among his people, Jerusalem. But it's used in such a way as to emphasize the, the meeting place, as it were, between God uh, coming down on Mount Zion and meeting with his people there. So whenever Zion is, is used, it's like that's the image that should come to the forefront of your mind that separates, that distinguishes Jerusalem and its capital of, of Judah and Israel as setting it apart from any other place in the world because that's where God meets with his people. And God accomplishes his purpose with his people. God sets apart his people from everybody else um, at Zion. That's where the action happens. When you think about that, what, what's, what's meant to be said about may all who hate Zion be turned back in shame? Uh, you, hatred, in this case, you, you know the phrase, haters gonna hate, um, when... There's something good that's happening there, but another, nevertheless, people will despise it, forget about it, disregard it as nothing. Uh, uh, that that's a reality that people who have come to associate themselves with covenant fellowship with the living God, as it is here with regards to uh, the Jews and understanding their living relationship with God, and later on with Christians who, through faith in Christ, exercise uh, um, a covenantal living relationship with the living God. And what does Jesus say? That uh, if people hate you because of me, keep in mind they hated me first. Walking in living faith with the living God um, is going to bring about conflict or uh, oppression, persecution, and the like. Uh, it's something that's going to happen. And now, this is where the whole grass on the roof thing actually comes, is, is, is really pertinent, actually. So, with grass on the roof, uh, uh, does grass grow on your roof? It doesn't grow on mine. But oddly enough, there's some weird occasions where uh, if, like, if the gutters haven't been cleaned and there's an accumulation of of dirt that gets swept up in there and occasional seeds that tumble into there and then there's 
water and sunlight that pours into those gutters, sometimes something will actually grow up there, uh, which uh, is disturbing. That's why it's important to clean out our gutters so that we don't have to, you know, uproot things out of the gutters. It was not uncommon, certainly, uh, within an agrarian society, and many uh, homes are actually built out of sod or sod materials with grass seed in them that can occasionally, after rains and sunlight, sprout on a roof of, of people's houses and homes. But that the, the grass that's growing there lives for a time, but then uh, is um, almost immediately scorched. It can't last. And one of the things, the, the, the parallel that the psalmist is drawing is saying that that it will not deny the fact that uh, that oppression and affliction that comes from the hands of the enemies of the people of God is real. But it's not lasting. Uh, that God, whose love and covenant faithfulness and righteousness and justice is as eternal as the one who gives it and establishes it, that that kind of God is a God who's a lasting God who can be trusted in that there's no uh, uh, affliction or oppressor uh, who can last. It may sprout for a time, but inevitably it's going to wither. It's going to pass away. It's not going to last. And uh, and it's it's like as it is uh, described by the, the the wicked in Psalm one, who the psalmist describes they're like chaff that the wind blows away. It's there for a moment, but then uh, it's it, it, it is eventually going to 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 perish. The people who set themselves up against the purposes of God, uh, though their affliction. And their, their persecution is certainly real. None of it is, is going to last and is certainly, certainly not going to champion over the purposes of the living God. Uh, that's why this psalm is a psalm about a test of faith. That, that we could, in this sense, join in the chorus of, of Israel saying, They have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Not our youth specifically, but rather... Um, the long history of the people of God who faced persecution and affliction without flinching because they, they rested their faith on the promises of the living God and that faith did not disappoint them. And actually, this is a, a great opportunity after reading a psalm like Psalm 129 uh, to reflect uh, on Hebrews uh, Hebrews chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what's, uh, typically called the, or, uh, has been uh, called the hall of faith, the hall of faith where the author of Hebrews ex takes examples throughout Israel's history about people who took hold of the promises of God and bore the afflictions that were, that were thrust upon them because they held on to their faith and that their names, their legacy is a lasting one. To remember that people who bore the afflictions by holding unswervingly to the, to the promises of God, that we are recipients of that type of blessing because of their faith. Their faith that was strong enough to withstand persecution and affliction. I want to have that type of faith, the type of faith that isn't destroyed, but, the, but can actually withstand the test of persecution and affliction and doubt and despair and darkness. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a pleasant psalm, but it should be an encouraging one for us to think the faith and the trust that I have in you that's been planted into my heart. It may, at this very moment, be like a sapling. It's just, it's just a little bit. It's, it's, um, it's not very strong. It doesn't appear to be very fruitful. 
But God nurtured that faith through the testing and persecution so that it could actually get strong. And it, it becomes something that can last and that can pr bring about lasting fruit, not only in my life, but in the lives of everyone who, 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 who's around me. So let that be your prayer today. God, even if my faith is indeed as small as a mustard seed, <laughs> Lord, grow that faith, nurture that faith. Uh, help me today to live a life where the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are pleasing to you, that I've learned to fear you and to love you wholeheartedly, and that that faith that, that's been planted in my heart uh, becomes something that is is as robust as the God uh, upon whom it depends and upon whom it leans and upon whom it trusts. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. The coffee must be extra strong because I feel extra long-winded today. So uh, thank you for bearing with us. But surely you can see how uh, even short psalms like these, there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> uh, so I really hope for the time that we are able to meet on Wednesdays and Sundays that we can unpack the scripture together. And I, I could hear uh, your observations and what what you're seeing and how you're learning to struggle with the text and struggle well with the text. So I do hope for the day that we're able to meet again. Uh, again, don't forget to check the descriptions and the link. Subscribe to the to this uh, to our daily devotions. And I look forward to when we get to meet again soon. So. I love you guys. Take care. God bless you. Uh, and may he keep you and sustain you and use you in ways that uh, you had never imagined. So love you guys.